Greetings and salutations. Today we will be covering the enigmatic enclave of paranormal puzzles, known as the Lost Village of Dudley Town. Nestled deep within the heart of Connecticut, it is a forsaken hamlet which has earned a sinister reputation, marred by the tales of restless spirits, malevolent demons, and unexplained disappearances. Legend has it that this dark legacy was brought upon by a curse, a dire affliction allegedly bestowed upon it by the Dudley family, pioneers who ventured into the new world in pursuit of a new life in the remote expanses of northwestern Connecticut where the mountains cast long shadows and time passes more slowly is where the once vibrant community of Dudley Town can be found. Its houses and hearths have long since crumbled but the land upon which this eerie enclave once thrived remains far from vacant. Within the embrace of the forest and its craggy outcroppings, tales of spectral apparitions, malevolent entities, and enigmas unsolved resonate throughout the ages, intertwining with the very fabric of America's own origins. However, the question lingers, does any of the so-called curse hold the grain of truth, or is it merely the function of a chilling fragment of memory? Today, only the hollowed out cellar holes and weathered stone foundations bear witness to Dudley Town's existence. The roads which once led their way to this forsaken place have dwindled to little more than overgrown walking paths. Only a select few intrepid hikers and the occasional ghost hunter muster the courage to trek upon the dark and eerie road which is required to venture into these foreboding woods, especially when the moon's pale light bathes the landscape in an otherworldly glow. The journey begins with the land itself, a parcel once owned by Thomas Griffith, an early settler who laid claim to these Connecticut territories in the early 1740s. Though there are no definitive records indicating his abode was in the terrain, the fact remains that the Griffiths held domain over half the land as early as 1741. It wasn't until the arrival of a man named Gideon Dudley in 1747 that the village would etch its name into the annals of history. Gideon's entry onto the stage was accompanied by two brothers and thus fate was sealed. Over time, the Dudley name would become synonymous with the land's foreboding curse. The origins of the curse are traced by some all the way back to England in the year 1510. This year marked the beheading of Edmund Dudley, who was implicated in a plot to unseat King Henry VIII, legend has it that a curse was cast upon the Dudley family, decreeing that their descendants would be entwined in a grim tapestry of both horror and death. As proponents of this eerie tale would have it, the Dudleys would soon find themselves ensnared in an endless spiral of misfortune. Edmund's son, John Dudley, had harbored ambitions to sway the destiny of the British throne. As he orchestrated the union of his son, Guilford with Lady Jane Grey, a pivotal figure in the line for the royal crown. Lady Jane briefly ascended to the throne after the death of Edward VI before her ill-fated reign met its tragic end, resulting in the execution of both her and the two Dudleys. To compound matters, Guilford's brother returned from France, bearing a virulent plague that he unwittingly would unleash upon his fellow officers and troops. This contagion rippled across the landscape, leaving a wake of death that claimed many. In this intricate tapestry of misfortune, we encounter John Dudley's third son, Robert Earl of Leicester, who basked in the favor of Queen Elizabeth I. Sensing the winds of change, Robert embarked on a journey to the New World, seeking refuge across the Atlantic. Yet it would be his descendant, William, who would ultimately plant roots in Guilford, Connecticut. Three generations down the line, Abiel, Bazari, and Gideon would converge to purchase a plot of land within the township of Cornwall, and things would not get better for the Dudleys from there, as their misfortune would cast a long and ominous shadow over the quaint town. However, when analyzing the curse from the point of lineage, we do run into a snag, particularly with the lineage of William Dudley, the progenitor of Dudley Town. To connect the threads of the curse to him, William would need to be the son of Robert, Earl of Leicester, a crucial link which seems to be broken 
since Robert Dudley, it appears, only sired two sons, one who he tragically lost in early childhood, while the other journeyed to Italy and set up roots there. While he did have descendants, they would remain in Italian soil for the long run, meaning they were severed from Dudley Town's legacy, thus the concept of the town's curse being entwined with the specter of a bloodline's curse becomes all but impossible. Now that the curse being tied to a lineage can be discounted, the darkness that enshrouds Dudley Town takes a different hue. Rather than it coming from a curse tied to a family, this darkness emanates from the very land itself. Records of the land's past reveal that it once belonged to the Mohawk Indian tribe, a people whose footsteps left an indelible mark on the land. Yet these chronicles divulge little else. As pioneers ventured forth and settled the lands, the concept of the land itself holding ancient secrets and being a living testament to the indigenous peoples who once inhabited is brought to the forefront. However, anything involving cursed burial sites and the like are merely supposition. Now that the stage is set, it was in the early 1740s when Thomas Griffiths acquired the very land that would form the foundation of Dudley Town. In present day, the landscape remains virtually unchanged. A thick shroud of dense forests and rugged terrain strewn with age-old stones, which are cradles of the land's past. Towering mountains loom overhead, casting long foreboding shadows, which further cloak Dudley Town in what seems to be perpetual twilight. In the year 1747, Gideon Dudley embarked on a journey of ambition, purchasing a tract of land from Griffiths with the vision of establishing a modest farm. Gideon's pioneering spirit would soon find kindred echo in his two brothers. They hailed from Guilford, Connecticut. The year 1753 would see their arrival as they too had acquired parcels of land in the vicinity. Another important figure was Martin Dudley, hailing from Massachusetts. However, it must be noted that even though they shared a last name, they were unrelated. It was just happenstance that led them to live next to each other. And eventually, Martin would marry Gideon's daughter, meaning she went from being a Dudley to being a Dudley. It is important to note that despite its name, Doodley Town in truth was never a bona fide township itself. Rather, it existed as more of a secluded enclave nestled within the broader expanse of Cornwall. Doodley Town was ensconced amidst the embrace of three formidable hills and found itself shrouded in twilight even at high noon. The township of Cornwall had proved itself inhospitable for traditional farming endeavors, leading to the foundation of Doodley Town. As the iron ore deposits in the vicinity came to light, agriculture quickly receded into the background, yielding precedence to the promise of an industrial bounty. In spite of these developments, Doodley Town remained devoid of the trappings of much of civilization. There were no proper stores, shops, schools, or even churches settled on this land. Not only was there no church in town, but the absence of a cemetery truly underscored the isolation that gripped Doodley Town. The population of this enclave would never swell to great numbers, as depicted by an 1854 map which documented the peak number of families dwelling in Doodley Town being a mere 26. Yet within this seeming isolation, Doodley Town would thrive for a time. Time. It carved out its niche as a hub for timber, its lush woodland serving as a source for timber that yielded valuable wood coal. This resource would find its way into the nearby Litchfield County iron furnaces in Cornwall, along with neighboring townships. However, once extracted from the local terrain, the harsh reality of the mountains and removing said wood would prove unsustainable for the mill's operations, and harvesting would eventually decline. Delving deeper into the past of Doodley Town, we unearth a trove of perplexing incidents, and said incidents were largely what has given this former hamlet its reputation. Even though in recent years some have sought to dismiss the peculiar occurrences as mere anomalies in a small isolated community, the counter-argument is often that the scant population should not have such a scale of unexplained incidents, and just because they were a small population does not lessen the significance of said 
bad incidents. However, the question that remains is, do such a frequency of bizarre deaths, inexplicable disappearances, and instances of insanity just turn out to be a statistical anomaly? Or is there some deeper meaning to the frequency of such events? Now, it is undeniable that the small number of residents in Dudley Town might distort our perspective, making these events appear statistically unusual, yet the eerie tapestry of the community's history leaves those who observe it with a lingering sense of disquiet. Beyond the documented cases, there are multiple whispers, rumors, and legends of additional individuals who succumb to madness and those who mysteriously vanished and became footnotes to an enigma that defies easy explanation. It is little wonder that, whether founded in fact or fiction, the shadow of Dudley Town's curse casts a chilling pale over the landscape. Peeling back the layers, we discover that three of the Dudley family members who ventured far from the hills ended up leading long and prosperous lives. This extinguishes any notion of a malevolent curse being tied to the families. Only Abel Dudley remained ensconced in Dudley Town and tragedy would befall him as a series of misfortunes drained his wealth and ultimately his sanity. In the year 1799, at the age of 90, Abel met his end, his senility and insanity stealing every last shred of his personhood, leaving him bereft of reason. His fate sadly would not stand alone. Seven years before his passing, his close friend and neighbor, Gershorn Hollister, met a tragic end while constructing a barn at the residence of William Tanner, Abel's nearest neighbor. Tanner too was said to have succumbed from insanity, although it was likely a result of old age rather than supernatural forces. Remarkably, Tanner lived to the staggering age of 104 years old, his mind seemingly marked by a degree of dementia in his final days. But it must be noted that there are legends of Tanner having spoken about strange creatures which emerged from the forest. However, it is difficult to discern whether these accounts were born of unexplained sightings or the ravages of Tanner's fragile mind slowly eating at itself. In 1759, the Nathaniel Carter family arrived in Dudley Town, taking residence in a house formerly owned by Abel Dudley before his descent into the depths of madness. As fate would have it, a mysterious plague would descend upon Dudley Town and its neighboring Cornwall, claiming the lives of the Carter family, kin to Nathaniel. Overcome by grief, they departed Dudley Town in 1763, seeking solace in New York. Those who believe in the notion of the curse assert that the malevolent specter of Dudley Town clung to their heels. However, their tragic fate finds parallel in the harsh realities of the early frontier. The Carters vanished into the perilous Delaware wilderness within what was referenced at the time as Indian Territory. During a brutal attack, part of the family was mercilessly slaughtered, his wife and infant child suffering gravely before their end. The Carters' three remaining children were abducted and transported to Canada. While his two daughters were ultimately ransomed, the son, David Carter, chose to remain with his captors, later marrying into the natives who had kidnapped him, and ultimately returning to the United States for his education. Remarkably, his journey would lead him to becoming a newspaper editor. Another tragedy would mar the life of one of the region's most illustrious residents, General Herman Swift, a veteran of the Revolutionary War. In 1804, a bolt of lightning struck his wife, Sarah Fay, as she stood in the front porch of their home near Dudley Town, ending her life in an instant. The general shattered by loss descended into madness and pass away soon after. While some may have sought to assert a direct connection with Dudley Town and its curse, it must be noted that they were left to contend with the fact that Swift did not dwell in Dudley Town proper. He actually resided on Bald Mountain Road, where his house still stands to this day. However, the narrative of his family is tied to Dudley Town, in part due to how sparsely populated the area was. Records indicate that three individuals succumb to insanity in less than half a century in such a small general region. 
This could be seen as a mere coincidence. However, there are those who believe there is more to the story. Moreover, there are those who argue that a person being struck by lightning on their own porch should not be categorized as ordinary, but rather strange due to the preventative measures on most houses at the time. Yet another figure tied to the curse of this town is Horace Greeley, editor and founder of the New York Tribune. However, this link to the curse is easily debunked. This is due to the tie to the curse being Greeley's marriage to a young woman named Mary Young Cheney. It is alleged that she hailed from Doodley Town. In truth, Mary was born and raised in Litchfield and she never set foot in Doodley Town. Her departure from the area dates back to 1833 when she resided in a boarding house owned by Dr. Graham who is inseparably linked to the Graham Cracker. It was there that she met and later married Horace Greeley. In 1872, Greeley mounted a presidential campaign against Ulysses S. Grant, culminating in his electoral defeat. However, shortly before the election, Mary fell victim to a bout of lung disease and passed away in New York City with her husband and two daughters by her side. She found her final resting place in Greenwood Cemetery and contrary to the legends that insinuate her passing was that of self-termination, her passing was anything but self-inflicted. Tragically, Greeley himself followed her into the grave shortly thereafter, a mere month after the loss of his wife. The journey into the misfortunes of Doodley Town take us to 1901, a time when the population of the town had dwindled to a mere handful. One of its last residents, John Patrick Rofi, had tragedy fall in his lap, delivering several blows in short order. First, his wife succumbed to consumption, a not too uncommon fate given the lack of proper medical care. Her affliction spanned years, yet her passing, while expected did little to mitigate the man's grief. However, the anguish was compounded shortly thereafter her funeral, when his two children inexplicably vanished into the nearby forest. Although they had been accused of minor offenses, there is no concrete evidence to suggest that their disappearance was voluntary. They seem to just have been devoured by the forest, leaving no trace to even give hope to their father. Shortly thereafter, the family's home was consumed by an unexpected fire, reducing it to smoldering ruins. Not long after this, John himself embarked into the forest, never to be seen again. By the early 1900s, Doodley Town had become a desolate ghost town, its remaining homes succumbing to the relentless grip of time and decay, the forest eager to reclaim its lost territory. Yet amidst this haunting abandonment, one more death would emerge. This is an enigma that proponents of the curse have woven into Dudley Town's eerie tapestry. While the existence of the curse may remain contentious, this case of insanity stands as a chilling testament to the isolation this region provides. In the waning years of the 19th century and the dawn of the 20th, a man by the name of Dr. William Clark embarked on a journey that would forever entwine his destiny with Dudley Town. Born in 1877 and raised in the fertile fields of Tenfee, New Jersey. Dr. Clark's path had led him to become a professor of surgery, imparting his knowledge to others at the esteemed Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Clark's heart, however, could never remain in the ceaseless bustle of the city, and he required a retreat to the serenity of nature and the tranquil rhythms of rural life. His quest would eventually bring him to Cornwall, where the forests seemed to beckon to him. He embarked on a monumental endeavor, acquiring a thousand acres of pristine wilderness, a veritable kingdom which included Dudley Town itself. In a symphony of labor and love, he began erecting a summer haven, a vacation sanctuary where he and his beloved wife, Harriet Bank, Clark could bask in the scenery of nature's embrace. Over the span of numerous years, the couple's visits to this woodland area became a cherished tradition, a respite from the clamor of city life. Weekends spent amidst the tranquil embrace of nature's splendor or the joyful sojourns of summer had borne witness to their shared happiness. Yet the annals of Dudley Town would not take this lightly. In an eerie turn in the summer of 1918, one fateful weekend left Dr. Clark receiving an urgent summons to return to the bustling metropolis of New York for a medical emergency. His wife Harriet, however, remained in their woodland sanctuary. It was upon his return 
a mere 36 hours later that the doctor was confronted by a harrowing transformation. Harriet had seemingly descended into madness, echoing a lamentable fate of the previous residents of Dudley Town. According to the chilling accounts, she spoke of grotesque creatures that had emerged from the very heart of the forest, launching inexplicable attacks on her fragile psyche. In the throes of her torment, she had made the choice to self-terminate. However, with further inquiry, one can find that in the years leading up to her heart-wrenching self-termination, Miss Clark had wrestled with a supposed chronic illness. The veil surrounding the nature of this affliction remains impenetrable. However, it is a possibility that this was a psychiatric illness, which was not directly referred to as such, in order to maintain the family's dignity due to the stigma that such illnesses had at this time. And if so, the path to her self-destruction becomes a lot less supernatural in nature. Years after the heart-wrenching loss of his beloved Harriet, Dr. Clark found solace in the embrace of Lovanu. In the spiritual renewal, he and his new wife, Carita, revisited his woodland haven, continuing the tradition within the idyllic gateway. In due course, they embarked for the construction of a grander abode nearby. Amidst the passage of time, the year 1924, became a significant chapter in Dr. Clark's life. Along with his wife and a cadre of fellow physicians, friends, and ardent landowners, they formed the Dark Entry Forest Association, whose primary objective was to preserve the forest surrounding Dudley Town in a state of perpetual wilderness. Their inaugural assembly, convened in 1926, had 41 members amongst its ranks. As the years unfolded, fate cast its die once more upon Dr. Clark as he breathed his last breath in Cornwall, Connecticut in February 1943. Carita, his faithful companion, followed her beloved spouse. Echoes of the Clark family still resonate throughout the hills and valleys of Dudley Town, with several of their descendants and kin remaining in the area around this storied land. Today, Dudley Town stands mostly deserted, its once vibrant community a mere echo in the wind. Yet the allure of its enigmatic past continues to beckon curious souls and intrepid tourists drawn by the promise of unearthly thrills as the Dark Entry Forest Association maintains its guardianship over the lands which once cradled Dudley Town, ensuring the preservation of this wilderness. In the shadowy embrace of the secluded Bald Mountain Road, a handful of homes still stand, inhabited by those who call this remote corner of wilderness home. Some of them assert with unwavering conviction that there is no supernatural occurrence tainting these lands. However, this stands as a stark contrast to the beliefs of many. Yet, evidence shows that it is most likely that this improbable curse is more of an urban legend than anything of true note. Yet the annals of history seem to desire to attest to the unsettling pall of the unexpected and unexplained, as the chilling saga of Dudley Town took a haunting twist in the mid 20th century. It was during the 1940s that whispers of the supernatural first crept into open conversations amongst visitors who dared tread amidst the ruins of the forsaken village. Even in the present day, those brave enough to explore the eerie remnants recount harrowing encounters with the unexplained. They speak of ghostly apparitions lurking within the woods, supposedly capturing these phantasms through the lenses of their cameras. Others report overwhelming sensations of dread, mysterious lights piercing the darkness, and an unsettling symphony of unearthly sounds. Some even claim to have been physically touched, pushed, or scratched by invisible hands that emerged from the shadows. Intriguingly, certain researchers have deemed this forsaken ground a negative power spot, claiming that this is a location where the boundary between our realm and the world beyond blurs. They suggest that this phenomenon may shed light on the strange tapestry of events that had supposedly been woven around Dudley Town, while others claim the soil is poisoned by some malevolent force that has lingered there for centuries on end. However, not all voices agree with this supernatural conclusion. Skeptics and historians are quick to assert that this so-called curse of Dudley Town is invalidated by a myriad of sources. In the depths of Dudley Town's mysteries, one finds themselves 
standing on the precipice, on the abyss between belief in the inexplicable and close analysis of the evidence. While the tale of Dudley Town to some is a riddle wrapped in an enigma, many see these tragedies and unfortunate events as just statistical anomalies. While skeptics may dismiss the notion of a curse, many still cling to the idea that this land is quite cursed, a veritable forsaken realm, refusing to hear otherwise. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.